How's it going? Can we find you too? Thank you for coming to my talk. Actually, a quick question. Who here has heard of a podcast or other decentralized social media? So I guess I have to like go into details about that. Yeah, my, my talk uh, is this time not a CTR uh, click through rate optimized in terms of like the idle. We're going to talk about set reconciliation for storage heavy centralized applications. Uh, yeah, as I said, I'm Tim Dornschutz and uh, I'm the co founder of PB News. And uh, yeah, in case you've been uh, living under a rock and you think to yourself, like, why does crypto Twitter feel so dead? Uh, or, or you know, you're like, maybe this is just me, you know, like, but where, are, where is everyone? One explanation could be that uh, everyone has moved to other platforms, so there's like, nowadays there's like Blue Sky and, uh, you know, like Mastodon, and uh, for example, here on this graph, you can see that the Farcaster protocol had recently like a record of daily active users, um, basically with 2,500 daily active users in August. Uh, but also we had Vitalik sign on, and this was also a spike. And so, uh, the, but, but what is Farcast actually? So Farcast is essentially a decent, decentralized Twitter. Uh, that means if you, you can have a very similar experience to, to Twitter. They have like an iOS app, they have an Android app, a web app. But uh, why it is relevant for this talk is because they also publish a a uh, protocol inscription, and in that protocol inscription, they mentioned this uh, algorithm for set reconciliation that basically helps them to bootstrap this uh, decentralized network, essentially. And so, yeah, this is why I promise to you if you are staying until the end, then in that talk, you will uh, learn how to build a peer to peer social network, essentially. So, like the core algorithm that is behind that. Um, yeah, so that's the so the agenda for today. Basically, um, we are going to understand what set reconciliation is good for, essentially. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to give I'm going to dive into a, an example just after the agenda slide. We are going to talk about what the technical challenge of that is, how it works. I've prepared uh, two data structures that we can use it to run through it, and then we will evaluate basically our approach uh, after we've uh, discussed how that reconciliation works. So yeah, so first of all, what, what is it actually good for, right? Um, so here I, I've basically created this kind of like uh, mapping between the different protocols and uh, the uh, products that exist. So uh, just, just to basically give you an overview of, of what exists in the space, we have like Farcaster that implements the set reconciliation with Warpcast, and it's, I think like the Web2 equivalent today would be this, uh, uh, would be X essentially. Uh, we have Landstore with Lens and Momoka building on uh, layer 3. Uh, we have Prentech, uh, which, which launched on, uh, on base essentially, and I would have classified it as something like OnlyFans actually. Uh, and then the project that we are working on, PBUs, where we've been like, Pretty heavily inspired by the, the set reconciliation algorithm of Farcaster. And um, just to differentiate this kind of talk from like the blockchain talks in the house, uh, I also included this uh, this column here of like does does the social network actually need to solve the double spending problem? The reason why we all started using blockchains. And uh, I think for Farcast it's a pretty clear no. Like if you have Twitter, you don't need to sort of double spending problem for Lens. I'm, I'm not sure, but I would also go into the no section. I think for uh, for Frentech, I mean, since you have these like, keys and you need to trade them on a bonding curve, I think it's quite important. So I think it's a yes. And then for key use, actually, I should probably update this also to kind of like a maybe or a yes, because uh, for example, when you are, um, when you are uploading uh, on our platform, to have this kind of, you know, like Reddit, then there is like some component of double spending uh, that you need to solve. Um, but yeah, so like set reconciliation, I think you say, you or, or it's like a, maybe like a, a, a point of criticism, like why, why don't you use like a federated system, right? Like, uh, like Mastodon, for example, has existed for many years. There's also uh, systems like, I think, Lemmy uh, and others. And 
uh, and, and you know they have worked well, right? Like there the are big communities using these systems. Well, uh, some reason is actually that the node operator has a lot of uh, power in order to enforce the rules. And so this is from uh, someone actually that uh, from that area who also gave a talk uh, at Protocol for today, where basically I think he logged on to like a Mastodon instance. He posted, must have posted something capitalistic, and then basically the mods uh, suspended his account, basically with the, the, with like the reason, no, capitalists on here, thank you, might change my mind for a bunch of Moneros, and definitely not cross-posting to the public timeline. So I think uh, it, it's, it's kind of strange, but essentially in Mastodon, the, the handle that you are registering is with the no, with the node operator, essentially, so we are registering your name, I think, at, uh, at the node operator's handle. And then, as we will also learn, there are uh, permission peering agreements between nodes, which uh, essentially means, I guess, that you can lose all of your data, although I'm not really uh, well versed on, on like, math will really like, say that with node permissions. But uh, in, in terms of the the overall structure of the networks, I, I've come up with this kind of like uh, schematic overview where in the, in the middle you have like Mastodon and you have these different user groups um, represented essentially as these uh, fruits and also one vegetable here. And so you can see that not all of the nodes are talking to each other. For example, the broccoli uh, node is not talking to the kiwi node and you know like there's for example a rule on the uh, broccoli uh, know that no fruits are allowed, and so this is kind of like enforcement of uh, specific rules for the node operator. Um, and, and, and like you can see that there's like a you know there could be like peering agreements between certain nodes. And then on the on the left side, you, you, or yeah, I guess from the side on the left side, you can see like Elon's Twitter or X, right, which is just a giant blog where that houses basically all of the different user groups and I think many people have made kind of this uh, criticism that uh, Elon can arbitrarily enforce the rules and he also bought the entire thing with his own money and so on. So it's, I think, very different from like these other two approaches. Um, and then the last, the, the last structure that I'm here to, uh, to tell you about is essentially this idea of like Farcast and TV news that is very similar to how, for example, also Ethereum uh, manages uh, uh, data at the network, where essentially all nodes are talking to each other, and all nodes basically hold the entire network's data, right? So you, you don't have like a, a node operator, for example, uh, necessarily being able to execute on their own opinion of a, of a you know, certain moderation decision or whatever. But like the entire network is there. Uh, so yeah, that slide is uh, essentially a, a summary, basically, for this kind of network structure. The network maintains all of the data. The power structure, I would say, is like, quote unquote, peer to peer, because there is no, no one person or, or actor in the system that has like some kind of a higher level authority. And then we have this like permission disappearing, so you can talk to everyone essentially uh, without having to do like you know off-channel negotiation beforehand or something like that. So now we we've talked about what step reconciliation is good for, namely to build this specific type of network. And now I want to basically talk about the, the actual technical challenge, like why do we even need such a such a network? And so uh, for this part of the talk, since this is uh, formerly a workshop, I have also prepared this as a uh, as a page on a test data of which is the, the docs page of Kiwi News. So if you are scanning this QR code or if you're typing in this like uh, your URL, you can also follow along uh, in terms of like you know you can see all the graphics that I've produced for this talk or uh, if you're watching this on stream or on YouTube, uh, you can also just go through this uh, you know, again. So I'll just leave it up for like yeah, and for like YouTube people, it's a test data from slash EV stand slash many. Um, okay. Yeah, so the setup is the following. Um, we are on the internet, and um, 
we are sending this uh, data between different peers and uh, you know like how it is on the internet not everything is very reliable but the setup is that we have these like three states state zero state one and state two and i have uh, i have made like this met metaphor of, like these different pokemons where you can only evolve from i mean who, who knows who will doesn't know pokemon or to explain pokemon <laughs> okay. Um, so basically, you can only evolve from Charmander into Charmeleon, right? And then from Charmeleon, you can only evolve into Charizard, but you can never evolve from Charmander into Charizard directly, right? So this is a metaphor essentially for like a state that is dependent on other state. And then, like, I know when you are working with databases or blockchain programs, you come across this idea before. before. Um, but essentially here, we have these different peers, peer A, B, C, and D, and so on. And peer A essentially starts evolving into this new state, so it goes from state 0 to state 1. And it sends out this blue message to all of the other peers <coughs> of how to evolve uh, uh, as well into Charmeleon. Um, and so in step 2, you can actually see that this worked quite well. So peer C, peer F, and peer D all got the message of the memo, and basically they evolved. However, um, basically, POP was uh, offline during the time of sending the message, so it is not able to evolve, but it stays essentially in the Charmander, uh, in the Charmander state. And so, in step three, um, it comes back online. Okay, so it was just offline for some short period of time. However, in step three also, PRA is already evolving from Charmeleon into Charizard, and it's basically sending out this new type of message this time in pink of how to evolve basically from Charmeleon into Charizard, right? So everyone gets this message, so PRC is being able to evolve PRF and PRD. However, here's the problem for, uh, for POB, it never got the message of how to evolve into Charmeleon, right? Uh, as we as we saw in like in step two essentially. So now since we cannot you know like skip a step in the in the evolvement hierarchy, we can basically POP can basically not evolve from uh, from uh, Charmander to Charizard. So it's basically left left out uh, and it cannot you know uh, listening to the gossip basically doesn't uh, help it anymore. And so so this is really the problem that we have here, which is that. Uh, on a network, oftentimes uh, connect connections are prone to error, and um, offline peers that go offline always need to have a way to catch up, essentially. And so, uh, set reconciliation is essentially such an algorithm that helps you to catch up in order to listen then to to all of the gossip of the network after that again. Um, so yeah, quick recap again. So basically, we've learned what set reconciliation is good for. Uh, we have learned what the technical challenge is right now, which is this like, network is unreliable. And now um, I'm going to show you two ways of making, making it work, like making two computers essentially synchronize over network. The one is kind of a more contrived example using uh, bitmaps, and then we'll go into how to do that with uh, Merkle trees, and then we'll go to evaluate what we've done. So, there's a bit of a, a setup here, and now it, it's uh, finally becoming a bit more technical. Where we have uh, we have these set, uh, six different messages essentially, which is not uh, particularly realistic. But anyways, we have these six different messages. We can put them each through a hash function, and then so A equates zero in hex, uh, B equates one, C two, and so on and so forth until F equals five, right? Uh, and we have these two peers, peer A and peer B, they store um, these kind of messages. So you can see that uh, peer B stores A to D, and peer B stores uh, E to F, and they have the capacity to also uh, identify each of these messages using a hash function, so they can set like different flags in a, in a bit web, essentially. Um, and now the, the really goal of like set reconciliation is like how do we get these two peers to sync where the set of messages is reconciled and A to F is in both of the, the two peers. And so uh, this is essentially an example of that where we just initialize this kind of algorithm 
by uh, PoE sending uh, its own bitmap to PoE. PoE uh, receives the bitmap with the four uh, bits uh, set to uh, atomic to three, like three columns essentially, and then basically goes through all of its messages, checks which one are uh, available in PoE, and it sends basically in a step two all of the missing nodes to pure uh, pure A, right? So as you can see in step three already, pure A in this case is then fully uh, reconciled, right? However, we want to do it for both directions, which means that we have to basically repeat the same process but in the different in the other direction. So uh, basically, pure B also creates its own bitmap like the two messages at the end as uh, as existence and existent. And basically, in uh, step three, uh, PRA essentially validates these uh, these messages and finds that A to F is essentially missing uh, and sends them over. And in this case, uh, all nodes have essentially their uh, sets reconciled. <coughs> Now, why, why doesn't that work in real life? Um, it was a very sim simplified example of just having um, seven different messages and uh, six different messages. And so usually, I think when we're talking about like, uh, social networks, right, we have like, unlimited uh, possibility to define messages when we say, oh, right, not unlimited, but like, pretty large uh, possibility to, to define messages. So they can be almost like infinitely many. And then if we wanted to create this kind of uh, bitmap over all these different uh, messages where we would uh, you know, identify each as its, as its own uh, entity, for a KCAC 256 bitmap, we would have many too many slots to even store that on disk or, uh, or send it over the network. Now, I don't think we would actually build like a bitmap with KCAC 256, but we would use something like a, you know, like a Kumu filter or Kumu filter in that case. But even then, we would have a problem that this kind of uh, algorithm is not uh, deterministic in its execution because we can have uh, at least for group builders uh, false positives. And then also, when we're really talking about like you know synchronizing tons of messages over these networks, and we have to go through uh, all of the different uh, you know hashes of these messages again, then uh, the complexity becomes quite large and. I think for you can make a case that, for example, for uh, room filters or bitmaps actually might have a more uh, uh, complexity then. Uh, so essentially, bitmaps are good to explain basically what is going on, not so great to implement. And so, therefore, this is kind of the core of this talk. I think um, talking about how to do that with Merkle trees. And uh, the setup is very similar. We also have these two peers connected again over a network, but this time they are building a uh, Merkle tree over all of the messages which are in the tree, the leaves. So uh, peer A essentially has really the same messages, A, B, C, D, e, e, and F, and uh, it builds its root through that. And then uh, peer B essentially has uh, two extra messages, G and H, right? And they, they end up having the same kind of uh, hashing, I think, like from just from zero to whatever number essentially. Um, and it, I mean, we as humans for this like very small tree, I think we're quite uh, capable of identifying where are the where are the, the, the differences and where are the, the similarities. And so what you can see here by just looking at the hashes is that B one one with the hash 0xdf. Do you, do you see that? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit uh, small, but uh, anyways, like, that, that's the same hash as A11 here with, uh, with 0xdf. And so that means the, this entire like, subtree of A is the same as, as that of B. And then you can also see that for B23, uh, we have the same leaves. So necessarily, the hash needs to be the same, uh, which means that, that part of the tree is also the same. But like, as uh, computers that are in two different geographical locations, it's not that easy, especially when we have much more messages. So the question is now, how are we you know, communicating over a network? How are we going to synchronize these two, these two like, sets of data, essentially? And um, so the setup is kind of similar 
as before. We have uh, one peer essentially broadcasting out uh, like envelopes with messages. And in this case, we had a peer A essentially broadcasting out its uh, modal root, which is 0x uv w. And so you can you can I, you can see that here in step two, basically that's the that's the tree uh, root of A and that's the tree root of B. And for all of the peers that have the same tree root, um, as you can see, they can they, they just receive the message and they're like, yeah, I have the same tree, so we don't need to sync, right? If if we have the if we have the same hash on the root, we, we don't need to sync. However, peer B actually has a conflict, and so. Peer B, peer B's root is 0 x A D C uh, and uh, A is U V W. So they are a mismatch essentially. And what this means is that we have to look into all of the children of the root node and we have to analyze them as well, whether they are a uh, certain class of match, mismatch, or uh, missing. And so that's actually the first step of the set reconciliation um, algorithm. Um, uh, that, that, that I want to demonstrate here, we just label the, the tree root as mismatch essentially. And so that means that for all trees, we then have to dive into the level one nodes essentially and broadcast these over the network and check if they uh, if they are the same or, or different. And so that's, that's essentially what is happening in, in step two. Basically, we are sending the, the level one nodes, uh, B11 and B12, to uh, peer A, and then here on the lower part you can see the, the evaluation that happens through that. And as we have seen already before, for B11, which has the hash 0xdf, basically we are all going to find a match at A11. So that's done, right? Like the, the, those messages are all the same. However, um, for B12, we're going to look it up by hash, and we're not going to find it. And so it's kind of a, a problem, and we have to basically have this kind of algorithm of um, how we are classifying essentially uh, an object, and, and it will become uh, more important later on in the talk. So first of all, we are basically looking up when, when we get these uh, nodes from another uh, from another field, we're looking them up by hash first. And if we find that we find that exact node, we are labeling it a mesh. However, if we're not finding them by mesh, we're looking them up by the path. This is essentially this um, this like you know one one or one two, which just defines basically the the I guess the coordinate of the node within the tree. So this is like one level one, the first node, and this is like one level one, the second node, and so on. So we would be looking them up by path. And then thirdly, ah, and if we are finding that node, we are labeling with a mismatch because it has been it has been in the tree, but it doesn't have the same hash. And then finally, if we cannot find the node by hash and we cannot find the node by path, then we're saying that node is completely missing from the from the tree. And so I think that's like maybe intimidating, but that's really all. Uh, I think you, you kind of need to uh, keep in the back of your head, which is that we are looking up by hash, we find it, we are trying to look up by hash, which is the 0xgh1, we cannot find it, and then we are looking it up again by, uh, by coordinates. Uh, we can find it, but it's a mismatch. And if it's a mismatch, we basically have to turn, like descend into the children once again. Um, yeah, as I, as I already said, since we have a match on B11 with 0xdf, that part of the tree is now completely done. We don't need to look at it again. And this is, I think, if, since I've given you this kind of example of like a bitmap and how you have to go through each of the different messages, this is really where I think um, modal trees are an optimization because considering that you have this like totally all the local tree that you could have in a uh, use case like Twitter where you know the latest messages are always the ones that are uh, the most to the to the right of the tree then you, you it's very likely that you're gonna you know you're gonna look at this branch of the tree and you're like oh, okay matches head uh, the hashes match so we don't need to look 
you know, uh, hashes match so we don't need to look and so on. So there's like a, an efficiency, especially for like partially synced uh, nodes. Uh, but back to the algorithm, since this was a mismatch, we are now sending the level two nodes as well to POB, and this is really just a, a repetition at this point of the same kind of algorithm that, that we have been doing, right? And if there's a mismatch, we send the, the children and we look uh, how, what they create on the other side of the, uh, of, of the peer. And so, in this case, there's kind of a special, uh, special condition here where uh, if we look for 0x OPQ, then we're actually finding it in a different spot but since the hash is the same, we are just labeling it a match. And if we look back at our tree, then these are, this is exactly this kind of like, uh, these two uh, nodes plus their children, which are, which were at, at different paths in the tree, but have essentially the same uh, hash because they have the same uh, data nodes like E and F, right? Uh, so we can also, uh, mentally, like check mark that as uh, as synchronized, but then for uh, e to four, we are looking at its hash, which is zero uh, x p r s, and uh, we are not finding it. And then we are looking up at path, so path two four, and we are also not finding it. Uh, which means if we go back to this, um, if we go back to our rules, that we're going into this like. Uh, rule number three, three <coughs> um, looking up by hash, looking up by path, nothing to create anything, means that the node is completely missing from the tree. Ah, no, sorry, sorry, it's a mismatch, it's a mismatch, so we have to dive into, sorry, we have to dive into, into the children again. Um, but now, <laughs> sorry, but now actually, uh, this was a mismatch, so we are going back in the children again, we are transferring G and H to P or A, and in this case, we are looking for its hash. So this is not so we're looking for its hash, we cannot find it. We're looking for its positions, we cannot find it. So we are labeling them actually as missing. And in case some like a node is missing, and uh, it's also a leaf node, so it contains data, then the rule is that we're just going to add it to the data set. And this means that between step five and step six, we are essentially adding G and H into pure A's data set. And if you know about like Merkle trees, if you are adding data, you have to recompute from the children up all of the, the hashes again. And uh, as we know, if we have essentially the same identities on the data, we also have the same root hash, which means in this case, the um, trees are essentially synchronized. And um, basically, if you would repeat this process of sending out root hashes again, then these two nodes mm -hmm. would see that they are in agreement about uh, which data they are holding. Now, this can be a bit more difficult if, for example, you are uh, allowing to update nodes and so on and so forth. But uh, in, in our case specifically, we are not allowing that. So you can only have one like add uh, new data basically into these uh, trees. So, yeah, basically we have learned how set reconciliation works in a, in, a, in a simplified way, and now I want to quickly evaluate uh, what we have gained from that. So, originally the problem was that networks are, uh, network connections are error prone, right? Uh, it can always be that a node uh, goes offline, and then we have this like, uh, temporarily sorted state where, like, um, you know, a state transition might be dependent on like the prior state essentially. And we had this example, and so we needed this, um, we needed basically an algorithm that allows offline peers to synchronize and catch up to the rest of the network. And so uh, I have made a, uh, a, a comparison of the different uh, structures that we have. Uh, that I uh, demonstrated here is the bitmap, which essentially allows to, to do a deterministic uh, set reconciliation um, because you're dealing with hashes and it's not probabilistic. However, it doesn't really scale well with the number of messages uh, simply because the bitmap would become very large. Uh, you can, I believe, you can 
uh, verify the, the content in ChatGPT. If you probably if you would do like a Google, uh, an accumulation of all of the um, and then it's in the bit where you can generate a, a hash, I guess, and then you could compare that as well. So you could technically verify the content. Uh, for new builder that, uh, that doesn't work, as far as I know at least, uh, however, it scales better with the scaling amount of, of uh, messages, but it's not deterministic because we have, uh, I think, false positives. And then, so basically, really, um, the Using that work trees is quite beneficial because eventually they, you, you can have a deterministic set reconciliation. It, as we've seen with uh, you know checking off these like subtrees, we can create like a really nicely scalable uh, solution to uh, synchronizing uh, over peers, and you can have the added benefit of having like a verifiable content integrity where. It might suffice to even just checking the root nodes of two uh, EOS in order to understand whether uh, it's the same data. So, <laughs> I said that I, uh, I promised that we're learning how to build a, a, uh, a peer to peer social network, and I still believe that this gives it away somewhat. Basically, the recipe is that normally you listen to gossip uh, messages using. I don't know, like need to be gossip stuff. And then um, if somebody goes offline, you have this algorithm that I just explained. It helps you catch up to the latest state. And so if you're caught up to the latest state, you can still, again, just listen to gossip. Um, and the network maintains all of the data. Um, yeah, I'm working, or we are working, Black is here also, but we're working on uh, key news and we are implementing this algorithm. So that's uh, basically a, a website where you can, where we list all of the crypto content and you can basically run a node and uh, download all of the data using this algorithm uh, and basically run the same node as much as you could, like run an Ethereum node to you know, download all of the data. So, uh, it's at PDU, so that's why we or in this QR code. Yeah, and uh, it's supposed to be as simple as just like uploading, uh, and that's it. So that's how it, that's a very basic example of how it works. And yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. And if you have questions, you know, yes, if you need. Right? Yes. Questions? So, um, I, I saw you were like looking by roots or like children, trashes or whatever, and then also by art, which that we all have to rebalance those trees and have the same path for messages or like did, did I misunderstand that? Yeah, I, I think in, in the example that I showed, I think they would have to I think re rebalance the tree. But uh, I, I think uh, in terms of the actual implementation, I used uh, the Ethereum JS tree library where you can just enter the data nodes as you want, and then I've written this like the uh, walk tree uh, algorithm, and I'm, I, I think I'm like checkpointing the tree. So, to be honest, uh, it takes care of a lot of it, but the, the reality is a bit more complicated because actually, uh, at least for us, we are using Patricia working trees. So, but I, I don't know. We, I don't know if I can answer your question uh, very, very specifically, though. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This example was about partial data loss. Like, how does it work for a new node to actually get that Yeah, it, it would essentially work kind of in the same way. We would just uh, dive into more of the different uh, nodes until we find all of the, the data nodes essentially that we have to send over. So 
I, I guess if you, but it's directional, right? So like, uh, it, it can be that in one case, for example, you uh, you have no data and the node sends you like the root with the you know the full the full data root uh, and and, uh, and basically the algorithm that then uh, considers. Uh, that you know, on the, there's nothing to get from the MT from the MTPO. So like it's it's, it's always directional, basically. If if uh, I'm not sure this. Um, so if if this node would start sending. I mean, we, we probably have to go through the entire tree to demonstrate it. But I think if this node would start to send uh, the root, uh, sorry, if this peer would start to send the root to that peer, and they would start, they basically would already not find by the, would not find the hash, would probably also not find the uh, the position because there is nothing. Although I think for like a lot of like sparse merge tree applications, they are. At least the like empty, empty roots, right? Like all the empty nodes. So that's like another like uh, um, extra, like uh, different case. But but I think we would just label it as like as essentially like a mismatch. We would uh, and then the things we would uh, send into the into the children again, like not finding anything mismatch. You get not finding anything this much until we basically send like just the data nodes over. And since we yeah, we cannot find the data nodes. I guess I guess maybe the rule is the rules that I gave in the beginning, they are not uh, they probably won't work for all that kind of uh, kind of example. But I don't know. I'm just wondering, kind of based on that question, like what do you look at for avoiding like bosses? Because it seems like you can really easily like think funny and come up with like misbehaving weird nodes. Like a full reversal of the tree, especially in a first scale app. Um, like that would be pretty devastating. Um, is that like more like outside of the like, like is there something in this implementation, in the implementation of the DAP story itself, in like the retrieve implementation of the like, application that would fix that or is this something that's happening outside? And, uh, so those in the case of like sending for example like many tweets or no it's so, like if you like um a new client joins the network and then like uh forces the full traversal of the full tree um which is more than for example like the original example where like they could effectively just send over to new to new clients like um you wouldn't, you wouldn't initially force that, and so like you might just be able to like figure it out a lot earlier on based on the data. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. So, 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 just to repeat on the stream, basically, what uh, there, there would be a new node in the in the network that forces the traversal by sending like a fake tree or whatever, and, like always forces this like uh, traversal entire tree of like a, an honest node or whatever, and, and then we would basically create this kind of like. DOS attack or something, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the what I have shown shown not, it, it doesn't have any like protection against it. Um, what I've seen, for example, from Barcaster, although and so they had like a permission uh, set of uh, nodes, so they they are basically taking the ID of uh, the P2P and and you need to make like a GitHub uh, ER essentially where you are entering your own identifier and then I guess you would just be kicked out of the network. Uh, or else we're not even doing that so we can totally <laughs> break the side into that. But now yeah, I mean I, I guess like if I just had to like brainstorm, I think we could, for example, uh, we have like an NFT, so maybe if you buy the NFT, uh, you know, only then you can communicate with all of the nodes, you know, do something like that. Actually I Make me curious also how Ethereum does it because I think they probably also use a similar plan of the Thank you very much.